Good morning, everyone. I am really excited to be here and to share with you some of the work that's been ongoing in my lab at Rice University and to also share with you some thoughts that have been bouncing around in my head about the future of AV vector design and gene therapy in general. So I head the laboratory for synthetic virology research. And what, it, what I mean by synthetic virology, it's actually very specific. We think about the virus as a device that takes inputs and produces outputs. And so my job as a bioengineer is to simply reprogram what the virus accepts as input and then produces as output. Most of the projects that are ongoing in my lab uh, focuses on engineering the capsid shell of AAV. And we work with our partners in translational science to test our vectors in a variety of preclinical models. For a big chunk of my talk today, I wanted to talk to you about a platform that we call the Activatable Peptide Display. And many of you already know that the AAV capsid is a natural mosaic of three different subunits, VP1, VP2, and VP3, that self-assemble in a 1 to 1 to 10 stoichiometry to form this 60 mer. The other thing you may also know is that the longer N termini of the VP1 and VP2 subunits these N termini are initially hidden on the inside of the capsid. And when the virus internalizes into endosomes, the low pH and other endosomal factors, most likely uh, lysosomal proteases, these factors are sensed by the AAV capsid. And the capsid undergoes a conformational switch. And these peptides that were initially hidden, they pop out onto the surface of the capsid. And so many years ago, we thought that is a really interesting structural output of this virus. And so we decided to insert a hexahistidine tag into that domain that pops out. The idea, of course, is that when the virus is intact, the hist tags would be hidden. But upon activation, these hist tags would be displayed on the surface of the capsid. Now, as I told you, the endogenous stimuli for this virus are pH and other endosomal factors. We don't know exactly what they are. Uh, but in the test tube, we can induce this conformational switching just by heating the capsids to about 60 degrees Celsius. And of course, when these hist tags are externalized, we can capture these viruses on a simple nickel column assay. And so you can see the x-axis. These are viruses incubated at various temperatures. And really, around the 60 degrees Celsius mark, that's where you see the peak. That's where we capture most of these viruses, because that's when the hist tags are externalized. At higher temperatures, the capsids denature, and so those genomes are lost from our assay, and that's why you will see a drop. So since the initial report, we've thought a little bit more about this functionality of the virus, and we decided to think a little bit more deeply of how we could push this. We realized that the longer subunits, VP1 and VP2, these are the subunits that have this activatable function, but they cannot form homomeric capsids. And this, been, this has been known in the field, meaning you can't make an AAV capsid that is entirely VP1 or entirely VP2. However, the VP3 subunit, the shortest of the subunits, you can form homomeric capsids. So you can make a capsid that is entirely VP3, but to our knowledge, VP3 does not undergo this activatable uh, switching. So we hypothesize that there must be a subunit that is in between the length of VP2 and VP3 that is long enough to be activatable, but short enough to form a homomeric capsid. So to test this idea, we generated a variety of VP2 truncation mutants. So we took VP2 subunit and we started chopping off the N terminus, 10 amino acids at a time, and we stuck a his tag on the very N terminus. The first thing we tested, of course, is to see if any of these VP2 truncation subunits could form homomeric capsid, so a capsid that's entirely of one type of subunit. And you can see by the genomic titer data that as the subunit gets shorter and shorter and shorter, we are able to produce more and more virus, uh, approaching that of the VP3 only homomeric capsid. And so that was really nice. But then you see that the DEL60 mutant, that, so that's the mutant where the first 60 amino acids have been cut off. Um, we see a big drop in uh, vector production. 
Once we looked at the assembly activating protein sequence, that's of course expressed in an alternative open reading frame of the AV capsid gene, we realized the mutagenesis that we did to create this mutant introduced a stop codon in AP. And so we believe that's why we took a big hit in vector production. And the blots just uh, demonstrate to us that indeed we do have homomeric capsids, single subunit composition, and we do have his tags. Now, when you look at the activatable peptide display functionality of these mutants, we see all kinds of craziness. Uh, just to orient you, the VP3 only, that's our negative control, these capsids do not display this functionality. So you, you can see that line is pretty flat. And then the graph right on top of it, you see the nice peak around 60 degrees Celsius. Now, all the different delta mutants, all these truncation mutants, they have activation profiles. They're very different. Uh, I'll focus you on this Del 51. That's the one that we have chopped off the first 50 residues off of the VP2. And you can see that we're able to capture a large fraction of these viruses before the incubation temperature, the activation temperature of 60 degrees Celsius. And so that told us that these his tags are already surface displayed prior to activation. We then, of course, went on to make mosaic capsids. So we decided to take one of our VP2 truncation mutants, the Del30. So again, 30 amino acids have been chopped off. Uh, and then we made mosaics between that subunit and VP3. And you can see that we recover the vector titers really nicely. So we see no differences um, between all the different mosaics. And when we take a look at the activation profiles, we see some re something really interesting. This mosaic is 75% activatable and 25% non-activatable. And you can see that this mosaic already has these his tags already surface displayed. This mosaic that is 50% activatable and 50% non-activatable has a slightly different property in that you can see at lower temperatures, some viruses clearly have his tags already surface displayed enough to be captured. Um, but then as you incubate to higher temperatures, more and more his tags are popping out onto the capsid surface. And then this third mosaic here, it's minority activatable subunits. So only 25% of the subunits are activatable and majority are non-activatable VP3 subunits. And you can see here that we have completely regained our activatable peptide display functionality, meaning at lower temperatures, the his tags are hidden, but at this peak temperature around 60 degrees Celsius, the virus undergoes this transition. And so schematically, uh, what we have is depending on how you make this mosaic, we have capsids with the his tags already surface displayed before or after activation. We have some viruses where some of the his, ta his tags are already surface displayed, but some of the his tags are initially hidden. And it's really only upon activation that pushes the rest of the his tags onto the surface. And then finally, these uh, mosaics uh, basically have the his tags initially hidden, but then it's really only after activation that these his tags will surface display. And by doing this work, we've completely accidentally stumbled upon a design rule for AAV capsids. Spe specifically, capsid mosaicism, meaning you need capsids that are of these mixed subunit compositions. You need that mosaicism in, it, in order to get robust activatable peptide display from the virus. Now, depending on how you make these viruses, you can make them off in this functionality. You can clearly make them on in this functionality. And you can have them display different numbers of these uh, peptide motifs um, after activation. Now, that platform technology was an example of reprogramming a very interesting structural output of the AV capsid. And in parallel, we've been doing a lot of other uh, projects focused on reprogramming the input of the virus. Most notably, we've been working for many years now on creating these protease activatable AEV vectors. The idea is that these vectors would be non-infectious until they come across a tissue region with elevated extracellular proteases, such as matrix metalloproteinases, and those MMPs would switch on viral infectivity in some way. We call this technology the pro-vector. And in order to make these, we genetically insert peptide sequences into the capsid that need to be basically cut off by these MMPs in order to switch on the virus. 
in the absence of MMPs, the viruses have low infectivity, but in the presence of MMPs, you can see the virus has switched on, in this case, GFP uh, delivery. And over the last several years, we've published a couple other papers uh, testing different parameters of the ProVector platform, um, trying to optimize the design. In addition, over the last couple of years, we've been working with our translational science partners to test this ProVector system uh, in a variety of in vivo models. And for this one, we're trying to go after heart failure, after heart attack. And so we do a single, uh, we do a surgical induction of MI. Two days later, it's a single intravenous injection of these ProVectors. And then several days later, we will sack the animals and figure out where the expression is happening. We work with a collaborator that has an imaging agent that will light up the active MMP regions of this damaged heart. And so here, the top row is our unmodified AV9 capsid, delivers the transgene IRFP in this case throughout the heart. So these are just heart uh, slices that have been laid out and imaged. You can see the IRFP expression happens everywhere, doesn't care where the active MMP areas are. But the bottom row, the, those are our pro vectors, um, delivers the IRFP transgene where you have elevated MMPs. And that has been recently published in Molecular Therapy of this year. We have since uh, expanded upon this technology. Uh, so we have a couple talks happening later today, I believe. Uh, so Susan will be talking about how we have now made a pro-vector um, responsive to membrane-bound MMP, so MT1 MMP. And then Mitch will be talking about uh, provectors that are now activatable by caspases, which is a signature of cell death that may be associated with certain disease, um, disease pathologies. So um, make sure you go to their talks today. Now, the protease activatable system, that was an example of going after an extracellular stimulus to control viral infection. And so for this project, we were really looking for an intracellular stimulus um, that we could use to control AAV uh, transduction. And this is one of those examples. We wanted to go one way, but the science told us to go a different way. Um, and so in our efforts to um, design an intracellularly activated AV vector, uh, we stumbled upon a domain um, that is in the VP1 and VP2 N terminus. So it's that same region that I told you about that is initially hidden, but then pop out upon endosomal entry. And so it, that's shown in the red box right there. And when we look at this motif, it's an SSS or an SST motif that seems to be highly conserved amongst um, many AV serotypes. When you mutate that sequence to AAA, we completely kill the infectivity of the AAV vector. Um, and then when you substitute those residues uh, for phosphomimetic um, residues, so these aspartic acids, these Ds, you can see that we now are able to regain the infectivity of this virus, suggesting that maybe this domain um, is post-translationally modified by maybe intracellular host factors. So Maria Chen here will be giving a poster on that. Now, in addition to these activatable designs, um, we've also been very interested for many years in creating protein AAV hybrid vector. So can we use the AAV capsid to deliver other things beyond just genetic cargo? And so, of course, the question is where on the AAV capsid, which is pretty tiny, where are you gonna attach a big protein on that capsid? And so in order to facilitate that endeavor, many years ago, we created a directed evolution platform called RAPID, which ultimately allows you to take your protein of interest and insert it randomly throughout the capsid gene and then do directed evolution selection to identify um, mutants uh, that have the properties you're looking for. So in this case, we took M. cherry just as proof of concept and we were able to identify an AAV mutant with the M. cherry surface display. And it is not in the 588 location that a lot of people do insertions. And uh, it may be hard to see here, but the, the M cherry AV capsids are nicely fluorescent um, under confocal microscopy. And so this study um, led us to think, okay, what other types of 
protein AAV hybrid vectors can we make? And so more recently, we've been interested in delivering the Cas9 protein on the surface of the AAV capsid. And of course, that may alleviate a lot of issues uh, with the delivery of genome editing tools, uh, the packaging capacity problem of AAV being one. And so Nikki Ferrani here, I believe gave a poster yesterday on, on this idea where she was successfully able to attach the Cas9 protein. So again, the protein form of this enzyme onto the surface of the virus. So in addition to the experimental work that we do in the lab, we've been interested for many years now on testing and using computational algorithms that could help guide our design efforts. And so in one of our earliest work, we wanted to find an algorithm that could help us in when we make chimeric capsids. So the problem is this, let's say you have two different AV capsids, AV4 and AV2, and you want to make a chimera of this. So you want to take a little piece of AV2 and pop it into AV4. So you make this chimeric gene that will then go on to make this chimeric capsid. The question is, well, exactly what chimera are you going to make? Um, and can you predict which chimeras would form and ultimately function? And so in order to guide us in this endeavor, we applied the schema algorithm that was originally pioneered by the Nobel laureate Frances Arnold in her lab. Uh, and the schema algorithm calculates something called a theoretical structural disruption, this E value. The idea is that when you take a piece of AV2 and you pop it into AV4, you're going to be um, disrupting some residue-residue context that already exists in AV4. And so you're simply counting the number of structural disruptions that you are causing through this chimerogenesis. And I'm skipping over all the uh, details here, but it essentially led us to support the, the, um, the idea that if you minimize the number of structural disruptions, you have a better chance of creating a capsid that will form and function makes a lot of intuitive sense there. And then at the conference this year, um, Nikki and Jaron, they have two other posters where we are testing several other types of computational algorithms um, to see if we can predict the form and function of, of AAV capsids before we do the hard work of making all of these different variants. Now, this is where I want to take a step back and think about the AV vector engineering efforts, big picture wise. Um, and I think certainly those of us who are attending this conference um, and who have attended the conference over the last several years, we know what the next thing in AV vector design is. It is going to be about the data. It's going to be about data-driven capsid design. We've already seen a greater number of these kinds of talks happening at this conference. And the key advance that allowed for this um, is the incorporation of barcodes and next-gen sequencing into the AV screening pipeline. And this is a paper out of Nakai's group um, who really laid this out fully. And so that makes me think, wow, you know, we're going to have all this data. And with all of the directed evolution efforts over the last decade, we know how to make lots and lots of viruses. And with NGS, we're going to get lots and lots of data on all of these vectors. Um, and we're going to be able to develop really solid empirical rules um, based on those observations um, that could then help us figure out how to make or how to identify vectors that do exactly what we want to do. And with empirical rules, these empirical rules, we're going to have a vector that works. We may not know why it works or how it works, but we know it's going to work. Um, on the other hand are these mechanistic rules. And as a rational uh, capsid engineer, I need mechanistic rules because it's those uh, biological mechanism, uh, those insights that I rely on to be able to develop better designs in the future. And my intuition is that the sweet spot is somewhere in between. Uh, we need to strike a nice equilibrium between these empirical rules, these completely empirical rules, and these completely mechanistic rules. And I think it's somewhere in the middle, and that's where we're going to be headed in the future. 
The title of my talk today, AAV Engineering, was actually given to me this year, um, but I thought that this is a really great opportunity to talk about engineering. Um, do we have any engineers in the audience? Anyone willing to, yeah? Be, okay, be proud, I'm okay. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to remind everyone about engineering, okay? So I use this term engineering actually very loosely as well as many other people, I, I say, oh, I made it, I produced it, I generated it, I engineered it, right? It just sounds fancier, that's why I use the term engineering. But engineering is actually more than that, and I want to remind people on a slide that's coming up what it is. The other term that I use very loosely is control, and this is where we hear a lot about, okay, I'm getting gene expression control, I'm achieving delivery control, and I use this term very loosely. Um, but I want to remind people that control is actually a quantitative engineering discipline. Um, and so I have a slide on that as well. Now, there is this notion that the traditional engineering disciplines, it's, it's unclear how engineering could play a role in a translational science like gene therapy that is so heavily bio-based. Um, because biology, I mean, let's admit it, it's extremely complicated. And so how can we develop an equation that's going to tell us exactly how to make a virus? I mean, it just seems implausible. But let me remind you, engineering in its full glory deals with complex systems. It's really about making, characterizing, controlling complex systems. The schematic here is of a space rocket, and this blueprint is actually very low resolution. It doesn't even cover all the circuit boards that go into making this rocket. The way that engineers deal with complex systems and build complex systems is by applying some of the basic engineering principles as listed here, abstraction, standardization, decoupling, and making sure that each part has quantitative specifications. And I'm really, I'll be happy to geek out with anyone after the session today, and I'm happy to discuss with you more at length about what these mean. So I just want to make sure that there is this appreciation that there is more we can do with an engineering perspective. Now, the second term I used is control, that word that I used very loosely. Um, and we actually have an engineering discipline uh, called control systems engineering. Uh, and this deals with an input and output um, of a process. And especially if you're dealing with complex systems and environments that you cannot predict, you don't know what's going to be there once you get there, you may need a sensor, and then you may need a feedback loop that will go back and make small perturbations to that process. And it's really the combination of these things that give you the control that you may be looking for. Uh, and so uh, control systems engineers, they've already entered biomedicine. We call that uh, synthetic biology. And I know many of us are thinking, you know, what the heck can synthetic biologists do? For us, I think they can do a lot. I can, they can help us design genetic circuits to not only make better producer cells, um, they can also help us design transgene cassettes that are really precisely controlled. And that may be important for certain applications where the gene expression levels need to hit a sweet spot. They can't be too high or too low. Now, there are many uh, gene therapy challenges, gene delivery challenges. Uh, some focus on the delivery vector. How do we design better delivery vectors? Uh, vector production, how do we make, as we heard already in the previous talks, how do we make vectors better? Um, how do we get the right level of transgene expression? How do we choose what to deliver, especially for polygenic diseases? Maybe you don't, you know, you are no longer limited to delivering just one payload. Maybe you need to deliver multiple payloads into the same cell in order to cure that patient. And then vector administration, how do you deliver, how do you administer this ve these vectors into patients more effectively? And under each of these challenges, I've indicated the engineering or quantitative discipline that could really help us out in this field. I think at this point, if we really want to facilitate gene therapy, um, we need to reach out and we need to work with some of our more quantitative partners um, and bring them into our folds and help them help 
them help us uh, solve our challenges. Just to summarize here, um, I have told you about our activatable peptide display platform. We discovered that capsid mosaicism is a really important design principle. I told you a very brief update on our protease activatable vectors. These are pro vectors, and we're going after diseases with associated inflammation. We're doing some early work trying to create these protein AAV hybrid devices, um, and we have some early uh, results demonstrating that we can carry the Cas9 protein. I'm really excited about the future of data-driven capsid design. And really, in that future, I think we need to strike a nice equilibrium between these empirical rules and mechanistic rules. <clears throat> and finally, um, I think we should reach across the border and uh, get more engineers and quantitative scientists uh, to come help us out and tackle our challenges in gene therapy. So with that, I want to acknowledge my fantastic group of uh, graduate students. I know many of you are sitting in the room today, uh, and of course, our funding support. Thank you so much, and I am happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, very good talk. Uh, so I believe that uh, we are still tinkering rather than engineering and sitting back and piggybacking the mother nature as far as designing is concerned. Uh, but, uh, and probably we need to use uh, more of deep learning algorithms to really predict or th uh, this only a deep mind or deep, algo uh, deep learning algorithms can come up with real predictions of AI structures which mm -hmm. are really going to uh, cause an explosion in this field. Mm -hmm. And Robert, anyway, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, for uh, did you try attaching any of the recept specific receptors, cellular receptors, uh, on the AAV surface, like ca ca instead of Cas9, <coughs> like for example, CMET receptor or something like that? So are you talking about attaching the ligands to the receptors right. on the capsid so we can redirect tropism? Yeah, and so we have not done that. Uh, we've th certainly thought about it, and the platform that I described to you where we've attached the Cas9 protein, it's very modular, so we can easily attach other kinds of nanobodies, for example, or other kinds of ligands onto the capsid. So we can certainly make capsids that are mixed, so some of um, the dongles that we've attached could have Cas9 protein, and other dongles could have the cell-targeting uh, ligands. Yeah, but we have not done that yet. That, that could be really interesting. Hello, great talk and uh, very inspiring. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is uh, uh, on your homomeric truncated mm -hmm. versions. Uh, do you observe that you can put uh, more cargo, uh, so let's say more transient, or perhaps uh, of interest to vascular dystrophy? I'd say it's if, uh, it's a little um, so one question is this uh, for the cargo. Number two, have you thought uh, for your hybrid uh, just to mix, to intermix uh, plasmids during the, the production? Because if you mix plasmids, uh, I think back in 2002, in one-to-one -one molar ratios, you can have like uh, hybrid uh, serotype generated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have not directly tested the cargo capacity change of these um, homomeric capsids. Uh, that could be really interesting, especially the ones where it seems like all the motifs are already surface displayed, and so maybe internally the volume, the luminal volume, is now larger because it no longer has any of those N-terminide tucked in. That could be really interesting. We have not tested that. Um, oh, there's a mosquito. <laughs> um, and then the second idea was just simply, you know, mixing, making these mosaics by co-transfecting plasmids. Um, and that's certainly one of the uh, knobs that we like to turn a lot, as you saw, um, just by simply mixing in um, these different ratios. We make these mosaics, basically. Um, and, and, that, and we do this when we take a hit, especially in infectivity. We think, oh, maybe the engineered subunits are taking over, and there, you know, there aren't enough of these infectious subunits. And so, when we modulate that mosaic ratio, oftentimes we can kind of regain some of that infectivity back. Yes, sir. But we move on to the next speaker. So, okay. Okay. so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.